This is just a quick message to let you know that Elucidations now has a blog. Check it out at Lucian, that's L-U-C-I-A-N, lucian.uchicago.edu, slash blogs, slash elucidations. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Welcome to Elucidations, a philosophy podcast recorded at the University of Chicago. I'm Matt Teichman. And I'm Mark Hopwood. With us today is Hans Komp, visiting professor of philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin and senior research fellow at the Institute for Natural Language Processing at the University of Stuttgart. And he's here to talk with us about discourse representation theory. Hans Komp, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, Professor Kamp, maybe to start with a fairly basic question. So you work in what's known as formal semantics, and I wonder if you could just uh, say something briefly about what formal semantics is. What are you working on when you work on formal semantics? Yeah, to begin with, formal semantics, in my view, is actually a rather misleading term. What we formal semanticists are interested in is pretty much the same thing that any linguist who is interested in semantics, that is, in the meaning of what we say and write, is interested in. And the word formal in formal semantics only indicates a certain way of going about this problem. And the term formal semantics became established in the late 60s and early 70s really as a way of contrasting what was starting then and has been going on under the name formal semantics since then, from what there was by way of doing semantics and linguistics at the time. Most of what people, especially linguists, understood by semantics was something very informal. There was a lot of work on historical linguistics and that connection tracing the meanings of words in the course of history, how a word like damsel changes over time and gradually becomes less respectable than it was at first. Um, Things like that. Uh, Formal semantics emphasized something very different about language and was developed in analogy with formal semantics as a part of mathematical logic. Semantics in mathematical logic is also more usually referred to as model theory, and uh, (coughs) that is a way of explaining how the meaning, and more particularly the truth conditions and conditions under which a sentence is true, of complex expressions, in particular sentences, is determined or are determined systematically by the what you assign as a semantics to the words or symbols from which they are put together. So formal semantics of natural languages is an attempt to do this, to describe this kind of dependency of the complex whole on its smallest parts in a systematic way. So the focus is on the rules that connect the meanings of complex expressions with the meanings of their constituents. And originally, in formal semantics, there was actually very little by way of lexical semantics, the semantics of individual words. And that has been one of its defects for quite a long time. In the meantime, that's changed. There's now a lot of formal semantic word on the lexicon as well. But formal semantics really is what anybody, or tries to do what anybody who wants to do semantics should be trying to do, explain what the meanings of the smallest components of a sentence are, and explaining how those systematically yield the meaning of the sentence as a whole. Yeah, so for example, I mean, the sentences we utter are built out of these simple parts. Let's just say words for now. I mean, it gets simpler than that, but let's just say words. You know, the sentence, Matt ate fish, is made of three words, mat, ate, and fish. And it means something definite. You know, Matt, it's only true in the case where Matt ate some fish. It's not in the, true in the case where Mark ate some fish 
or true in the case where Matt ate hamburgers. So a formal semantic theory would tell you how, on the basis of the definitions of the words Matt ate and fish, we get the meaning Matt ate fish. Exactly. And what one tries and should be trying to do in a case like that is to explain how the meaning and the truth conditions and conditions under which the expression is true depend systematically on the components met, ate, and fish. So the way in which the meaning of the sentence met, ate, fish depends on the contributions made by these three words should intuitively be the same as when you say, or when you consider the sentence, Mark drank beer. And so what you need to bring out the similarity between these two cases is, on the one hand, a theory of syntactic form. You have to have the, the part of the theory has to be that such a sentence consists of a subject, Matt, and then a predicate consisting of a verb, and a eight in this particular case, and fish as direct object. And moreover, the verb is in the past tense, so there is a difference between Mark ate fish and Mark will eat fish. They clearly have different truth conditions, so the tense comes in as a separate component also. And you have to explain in a precise way how the truth conditions of Mark ate fish come about through the combination, according to the syntactic pattern, of these four different components. This is something that I often say because it is extremely difficult to explain to people who haven't actually tried to do such a thing themselves why it should be such a problem. You might think that once you've got a good theory of the syntactic form, of the constituent structure of the sentences of a language, then, yeah, pretty much the work should be plain sailing. After all, we get these forms, we somehow presumably reconstruct these constituent structures from what we hear or read, and then there's a systematic procedure for associating or reading off the truth conditions of the sentences from that analysis. If we do it all the time and everybody can learn language, one might think that can't be all that difficult a problem. And the fact is, and it is something that you can only experience by hands-on experience, that the way in which syntactic structure projects onto meaning onto the truth conditions of sentences of particular languages such as English and so forth, that actually turns out to be an immensely complicated problem. We don't understand at this point why it should be so complicated. Why isn't natural language like a programming language or like the formal languages of symbolic logic, where the correspondence between syntactic structure and meaning or truth conditions is very systematic and very direct, just isn't that way. And that's why now for almost 50 years, many formal semanticists have been working quite hard and have been very astute and inventive in crafting theories dealing with the meaning, formulation, even just for one language, such as English. That's really interesting, that there's a difficulty here that wouldn't necessarily appear just from thinking about the job you're trying to do. So uh, maybe you could give a simple example of where this difficulty arises? Yeah, well, this is one example of, among, of course, millions, because I was just saying, it's the billions that make our lives so hard, as uh, semanticists. But it, many of them are not so easy to explain. But hopefully this gives you an idea. Compare the sentences, John and Mary got married, first sentence. Second sentence, John and Mary both got married. I hope you get the difference. 
What exactly does the word both do in this second sentence that makes you understand it as John got married and Mary got married, but not necessarily to each other, and in fact, presumably not. <laughs> Whereas John and Mary got married, the natural direct interpretation is they got married to each other. So we have to have just the right way of describing the meaning of both to explain this. We have to explain exactly what the conjunction to, between two names does, like John and Mary, because in the case of John and Mary got married, it feels like you're talking about a set of these two elements, John and Mary, it's this, this combination of the two of them, of which the predicate getting married is true. And you have to have a story about what it is for a verb to be correctly assigned to a pair of individuals as a combination, as opposed to its being assigned to the parts of this combination individually, as you have it in the second sentence. So you really already see here there's a number of things that are coming together. It's got to do with this distinction between this distributive meaning of get married, where it's true of an individual in virtue of that individual getting married to somebody else, and the collective meaning of getting married, where it's a description of a pair of individuals. It's got to do with the role of plurals. It's got to do with both, as I already said, and it's got to do with the particular role that and plays. So you were instrumental in the early 1980s at bringing about a sort of uh, revolution in formal semantics, a, a new way of thinking about linguistic meaning, which is sometimes referred to as the dynamic turn, going from what's called static semantics to dynamic semantics. And the framework you developed in order to uh, work with this new conception of linguistic meaning was called discourse representation theory. So maybe you could just tell us about what's the general idea behind discourse representation theory? Yeah. First, uh, as a historical remark, a discourse representation theory, as it was developed by me, was simultaneous and independent from a development by Irene Heim, who called her theory file chain semantics. The original versions of file chain semantics and DRT are, for a certain application, which was central in the beginning, uh, and I'll explain it in a minute, having to do with the way in which pronouns refer to things mentioned earlier in the sentence of a discourse. Equivalent. Irene, after not very long, actually turned away from this approach, and her work since then has been in what's called static semantics. She at one point said, okay, these theories are equivalent, let's just call them DRT, or discourse representation theory, <laughs> and after that, more or less, turned her back on this. But for those who think that this was an important contribution to semantics, it should be said in fairness that she developed these ideas independently, although coming from a somewhat different direction, and I may say something about this in a minute when we say more about DRT. Yeah, so perhaps first also a little clarification about what static semantics and dynamic semantics means. So static semantics is basically what I described in my answer to Mark, it is explaining or describing how the meanings of complex expressions depend on the meanings of their parts, and more specifically, how the meanings of the words that make up a sentence determine that its truth conditions. That is, I should have used the name before, but I haven't, that is what the person who founded formal semantics, namely Richard Montague, actually did. He transferred the methods of model theoretic semantics as they already existed with in mathematical logic to the study of natural languages. And even today, the bulk of what happens in formal semantics is actually phrased, presented within static frameworks. It's nowadays almost generally referred to as Montague grammar, and it is just what I described early on. So static semantics or Montague grammar is limited to describing systematically the 
meaning of complex expressions, in particular the truth conditions of sentences, as a function of the meanings of their smallest parts. In dynamic semantics, the perspective is shifted to another aspect of the way in which we in fact use language, and that is this. When somebody talks for a little while using a string of sentences, or also in a dialogue where the speakers alternate, it is typically the case that what has been said already sets the scene for the interpretation, for the understanding of what comes next. The next sentence very often, amazingly often, once you start looking at it, contains elements that by themselves could not be really made sense of, but which get their meaning from the way in which they are linked to the sentences that came before. And so if one takes that aspect of the way in which we convey meaning to others in speech and in writing, if one takes that seriously, then one gets to the need yeah, of formulating this kind of two-way interaction between what you could call the context in which a sentence is interpreted, in which it is given its truth conditions by the person who hears or reads it, and the sentences that are used in the context. The context is necessary to make sense of a new sentence. Once a sentence has been made sense of, it gets added to the context and it gets added in a particular way, it gets integrated into this identification or representation of the context you've got already. And that gives you the context, the new context, which will then be used for the interpretation that comes after the one that you've just made sense of. So that's the difference between static and dynamic semantics, and maybe that's also an answer to what you're asking. Um, so, yeah, once again, I mean, maybe you could give an example of the way in which this works or the way in which what has been said already contributes to the meaning of what gets yeah. said. Right, I'll give you what is my, has been my favourite example for now, well, since 1978, it's quite a while, and I still find it very helpful. And it's got to do with the different ways in which the simple past and the past progressive in English link the meaning of the sentence in which they occur to the context that has already been established. So I'm going to give you two pairs of two sentences each. And the first sentence is the same for the two pairs. And the second sentence is differ only in that one has got a simple past where the other has got a past progressive. So, first pair. When Alan woke up, he saw his wife standing by his bedside. She smiled at him. Second pair. When Alan woke up, he saw his wife who was standing by his bedside. She was smiling at him. I hope you get the difference. There is a very strong tendency to understand the second pair of sentences as saying the first thing he sees is this smiling wife. She was smiling already when the event of his opening his eyes took place. Whereas in the first example we have the simple past, she smiled at him, is more naturally interpreted as she reacts to his open his eyes by smiling. Not everybody gets this clearly enough, but my experience has been that people actually react to these two sentence pairs in this way. The original pair of pairs was actually in French. The original problem which got this whole thing, this dynamic semantics rolling, was in French, if French and other romance languages, Italian, and Romanian, Spanish, Portuguese, and a few others, have generally a difference between two past tenses that roughly correspond to the 
past progressive and the simple past, in English at least for verbs that describe events, they're called in French the imparfait and the passé simple, the imperfect and the simple past. So the starting point for all this was a question put to me by uh, my colleague of many years, Christian Rohr, who was then a professor of French linguistics in Stuttgart. How do you account for, how do you describe the difference between these two past tenses of French? So if you take these two pairs of sentences in French, the effect seems to be even clearer and more dramatic than it in English if possible. And so the point is that with this first pair, where the second sentence is in the simple past, that's like a description of two successive events, whereas when you have a past progressive in the second sentence, it sounds more like, I don't know what comes across, is that first sentence gives you an event, and the second sentence with its past progressive gives you a kind of background to it, a state of affairs, a process that was going on at the time where the event described by the first sentence took place. So it's a very different temporal relation between uh, the two events or states described by the two sentences. Succession, and in addition there's this element of reaction of the wife on the Ellen opening his eyes. Uh, but, but truly temporally, it's just a succession of the second event after the first. And in the other case, it is the second sentence with its past progressive seems to be describing a state of affairs that is understood as giving you the temporal surround in which the first event occurred. And so part of the answer I was trying to give to this question, what is the difference between passé simple and imparfait, was to say, one situation where you can see the difference is precisely where the sentence in question is part of a larger discourse. Well, in this case, it's only a discourse consisting of two sentences, but nevertheless, it's in that kind of more complicated linguistic structures consisting of at least two sentences rather than just one, where you can see the different effects that these two tense forms produce. And with the simple past tense and the past progressive in English, it's very much the same. So that led to the idea that in order to give a general theory of how form is related to meaning, that you can actually fit this observation about the different effects that these tenses have in these two cases. You can fit that into. You need a general framework in which you can describe how what's been said already in the example, it's this first sentence of Isla Pair, sets the scene for the interpretation of what comes next. And then you can say, within such a framework, how the past progressive differs from the simple past. So the IT, as far as I'm concerned, actually developed out of this observation about the discourse effects of these different tenses. And for a couple of years, I was kind of wondering whether one could get further evidence that one needs this kind of structure of the theory also to deal with other phenomena. And it was only in the spring of 1980 that it became clear to me that uh, another problem that a number of semanticists had been worrying about for quite a while and that had had some kind of new surge in then recent years, in the late 70s. The so-called problem of donkey pronouns, I can explain what that is in a minute, that that problem also could be treated using this kind of dynamic framework. And the theory of DRT, or the version of DRT that was first presented under this label, only dealt with the pronoun phenomena and left the question of tense and aspect, questions that I just talked about, for some other occasion. There was another paper appearing more or less in, at the same time in 1981 as this paper about the donkey pronouns that 
right, there's other application that really came before, but it's the work on the so-called donkey pronouns that is in fact qua predictions indistinguishable from the work by Irene Heim that became known as far trained semantics. So the coincidence is there, but it doesn't extend to uh, what DIT has to say about temporal reference. Okay, so the general idea then is that very often when I say something, uh, the meaning of what I say depends on what I said before. And what discourse representation theory does is it gives us a formal framework for representing just precisely how that process works, precisely how the process of the meaning of what I say being influenced by what I said earlier works. And one example we've looked at so far is past progressive versus simple past. So in the example you just mentioned, uh, when Alan woke up, his wife was standing by the bedside. She was smiling. The interpretation of she was smiling is dependent on the previous sentence insofar as it tells us when she was smiling. So what about the other case you've mentioned, these donkey sentences, uh, which is the other which is the other application of discourse representation theory that really caught on? What would be an example of a donkey pronoun? Yeah, so the donkey pronoun is actually a very old problem. It was uncovered by Peter Geach in the early 60s from scholastic medieval philosophy, uh, and he recognized its interest for contemporary logic and semantics. And I can give you just one example. It's the original one that Geach presents in his book, and that I think is also in the source that he used. And there are a number of different versions of it, but here is one. If Peter owns a donkey, then he beats it. Now, intuitively, in this sentence, he refers back to Peter, and it refers back to this phrase, a donkey. And it's hard to explain this without going into a little bit of logic and having a blackboard in front of you. So I just state the fact. It is the re relation between the pronoun it and this phrase, a donkey, that causes trouble for a number of ways in which one can try to deal with the semantics of this sentence. In fact, it causes quite fundamental trouble for static semantics as we have described it before, or Montague grammar, if you like. And it has to do with the fact that we've got an if-then sentence, if such and such is the case, then so and so is the case. The such and such is this statement, Peter owns a donkey, says something like, there is a donkey, such that Peter owns it. And then the then part of the if-then sentence has the pronoun it. And for reasons that I'm not going to explain here, it is that relation between this existential phrase, or that's what it looks like, a donkey, in the first part, in the if part, and the pronoun it in the then part that causes the difficulty. And the way in which that problem is solved in these dynamic theories, how you explain how this pronoun can pick up on this phrase, a donkey, is that you say, well, in a conditional, if then, you basically use the if clause to describe a certain kind of situation, sort of hypothetically. That is a situation in which there is Peter, and there is some donkey, that he owns. And you can then use the pronoun in the then part, which says something about any situation of the kind that this if clause presents, that the donkey, that's part of what the if clause says, whichever donkey that may be in reality, is the one that Peter also stands in the relation to of beating it. So, I mean, all the examples we've talked about so far are about people waking up in bed and about donkeys, but, I mean, of course, this theory has much more profound consequences than just for our understanding of these particular sentences. So, I, I mean, I know that one kind of application that DRT has had is to varied fields like computer science and linguistics and computer programming. You also, I believe, think that it has 
broader philosophical implications. Um, so maybe we could talk about some of those. I mean, first, what are some of the ways in which this has been applied in, in computer programming and, and in other fields? Uh, when in 1988 I went to Stuttgart to join this Institute for Computational Linguistics that had just been set up at that time and of which my colleague Christian Rohrer, who I already mentioned, had become a director, so he switched from French linguistics to computational linguistics. It was because they sort of said, okay, you, you do DRT and we implement it for you on the computer. Now, that seemed a very nice sort of division of labor, but in the end it didn't work all that well. And one of the reasons is, and I had my misgivings when I, I went there, but the misgivings proved to be even truer than I had expected. Automatic processing of language in the way that computational linguistics wants to do. But computational linguistics, that's how the field was understood then and in a way still is today is concerned with writing algorithms that you can run on a computer, and it enables the computer to do the same things with language that we can do. These certain things. But among the things that you would like it to be able to do that was a big motivation for computational linguistics at the time is to translate from one language into another. Now, it's long been known that if you want to translate properly, you cannot just rely on the form of the sentences let alone just on the strings of word and translate word by word, and that gets you into a terrible mess. So really what you would like is an algorithm that takes the sentences of the input language, like the text that you want to translate, for instance, from English into German, computes an abstract representation of the content of the sentence, and then transfers or realizes that abstract representation in the target language. Well, you have a, an English sentence as input, and you build some abstract representation, take that representation, and then you have another second part of the algorithm that puts it into German words. Now, DRT seemed actually a good way to go from this perspective, because it already had formulated algorithms that turn English sentences into the formal representations that DRT postulates. That's a very important aspect of the whole thing that we haven't mentioned yet. And perhaps we should say a little bit more about it in a minute. But so DRT actually is implemented also, on the, not on the computer, but just as a theory, by describing how sentences get converted into abstract representations of their content those then serve as context for the interpretation of what comes next. And when you interpret the next sentence, you actually extend the context representation you had with the new contributions that this new sentence makes to it. So processing a text from beginning to end on this picture is building first a representation for the first sentence then interpreting the sentence that comes next, the second sentence, in the light of that representation, thereby augmenting this first representation to one that now covers the content of the first two sentences, taking that to interpret and then incorporate the third sentence and so on. So it's a sort of stepwise procedure of growing abstract representations. And if you already are convinced that part of the content of such a bit of text or text has to do also with the way in which the sentences hang together, then something like that will be necessary. And you might then think, okay, this is just the right way to do the translation. I built a representation for the entire text with additional marks to indicate which contributions come from which sentence so that I have some idea of what the order was in which the information came in, and I might use that for the output. And then you have this other algorithm that starts first converting the first sentence into German, and then uh, given that, the next sentence. And it's a little more complicated because languages make these intersentential connections differently, but still, that was the idea. It just doesn't work, or at least in as much as it works, it's much more complicated than what DIT had on offer at the time, and even now 
almost 25 years later. It's still the case that although DOT has enormously expanded its repertoire, you cannot automatically use it in a computer algorithm to get good translations. So that's one part of the story, the, the sort of disappointing part. On the other hand, it is true that some people, and in particular somebody in Holland, uh, Johan Bos, who have used DRT to process language automatically, and it's now not yet practically used but at least it's very competitive with other methods used in uh, computational linguistics in tasks that often presented at large gatherings of computational linguistics as a kind of competition to you. And they involve drawing inferences from little bits of text. So you get a text say of consisting of one or two or three sentences, and then there is a putative inference from it, and the system has to decide whether it does follow from what the text says, and sometimes there's even the requirement that it should give some indication how it gets to the answer, and in case a putative inference doesn't follow from the text, it should identify it as not following. And so until not so long ago, these systems which make use of the sort of logically motivated representations of meaning or content of which DRT is one, lost out hopelessly against conceptually much cruder methods that are used by practically minded computer linguists who make use of very little linguistic structure but put in an enormous amount of statistics to get sort of probabilistic connections between, in this case, premises and conclusions. And since nothing really works very well, for a long time those systems still came out ahead, getting 75% of these cases right rather than 70% is already a, an achievement, <laughs> even though, of course, it really what you would want is the system gets it right 100% of the time, or close to that. But in the meantime, uh, so this DRT-based system that uh, Joad Wilson has put in place has actually, on a number of occasions, performed just as well, or it outperformed these largely statistically-based systems. So there is hope there, and they, yeah, it's quite impressive, and he has this constructor of these representations, the so-called discourse representation structure, the DRSs. So he lets it run on one year output of the Wall Street Journal, and the DRS has rushed by, and you can't even see them. They're not all perfect, when you look more closely, but they are good enough. I and mean, it's a major achievement, because... I mean, Sophisticated newspaper text is actually quite complicated, and that's certainly true of the Wall Street Journal. So as far as that's concerned, progress has been made, but that doesn't mean that we are really there, and good automatic translation is still a long way off. But so it might be fair to say, I mean, as a very crude representation of what you just said, that the DRC has been helpful in teaching computers to read the newspaper? Well... In a real application, what you would like such a system to do is to read large amounts of text and summarize what's in there. That's a way of showing that you've actually understood that you have a thread. And that is an application that becomes increasingly important, uh, especially in scientific contexts. Uh, biochemistry is a good example. The number of publications is so immense that there is no scientist who can read more than minute fraction of what's coming out. And it's extremely important for the way in which the research progresses that one can get a quick idea of what's been done. That is something that you simply cannot do by ordinary manpower, that is, get these abstracts that people can then use, sort of call up from their screen and to see if, if the thing that they would like an answer to has already been dealt with or that can and should do their own experiments. So automatic abstracting is a true need. And there has been work in particular DIT-based, but not only, for building systems of that kind. They're beginning to be all right, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And the real-world situation where you really want to end up with abstracts that are sufficiently detailed and correct 
that they only use for people using. That's still a different story from these competition situations that they have at these big NLP conferences. As we've been talking about, a central theme in discourse representation theory is that interpretation of language is kind of a two-step process. I hear a sentence, and then I build this sort of intermediate representation in my mind. In the case of discourse representation theory, it turns into this cool-looking like diagram of boxes and boxes within boxes and uh, rows indicating objects that you might refer to later in the, in the discourse and so on and so forth. But you have argued that these intermediate representations uh, that look like these cool box diagrams have a sort of, as it were, deep psychological reality to them so that there's something we have to learn about the way the human mind works by the fact that linguistic interpretation is sort of this two-stage process. So what is that exactly? You know, what, what does uh, DOT have to teach us about the human mind? Yeah, I'm not so sure that the intermediate representation you're talking about are, in my understanding, the most important part of the message that a DIT could contain for a philosopher. I would think the perhaps most important message that DIT has for philosophy is a message for philosophy of mind, namely that we can find good evidence of a linguistic sort for the assumption that the mind, when it processes language, and perhaps also beyond that, really uses representations with quite specific structural properties. Now, when you say this today, people say, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's no longer a very controversial method. But when DOT started, the whole idea that you make use essential use of representations in the account of what sentences mean and how their truth conditions are obtained in a systematic way from their parts. It was pretty much taboo. It had to do with this idea that many philosophers then, and certainly those in my immediate surroundings, had this idea, we cannot really look into the mind. So any kind of specific representation we postulate is mere speculation. And postulating such representations as a means of explaining how language works, that's at best just circular, because the only evidence we ever can get is from the very sentences that these are postulated to be representations of. Now, DIT breaks that supposedly vicious circle because of the fact that the representations it postulates, they occur both as the representations you built of something that you newly interpret, but as I already said, also as that which constitutes the context for the interpretation of what comes next. And it is in their capacity of context representation that they provide just the kind of information that you need to make use of the context in interpreting the next sentence. So it's not just the truth conditions that the context so represented embodies. It's really the way in which this context representation presents or embodies that context. The particular way in which the representation is structured. That is exploited so DIT contends by the human interpreter who has built that already in the interpretation of what he now has to deal with as the next sentence coming in. So the, the evidence, to the extent that it is or can be seen as evidence, really has to do with the fact that you wouldn't be able to get the predictions that the theory makes. Intuitively, there are in many cases the right predictions about interpretation of the next sentence unless you assumed that what the interpreter has already built, has the structural features that DRT makes explicit. So that's why it is a representational thing. And there was a lot of hooing and hawing over this after the first versions of DRT were published. People in Holland in particular, Hunendijk and Stockhoff, pointed out that the particular predictions that theory made could be obtained also in some other more static way uh, if you just introduced a more 
complex, you might say, machinery and more complex logical semantical notions into your theory. And that actually that line has been very fruitful for other reasons. It has introduced into philosophy of language and logic certain notions such as an information state as opposed to a proposition. It's something that has more information in it than just a, what makes for the truth conditions of a sentence and various other things. So that has been actually very useful in its own right. But the criticism, in a way, ignored one part of DIT that was really very important for me from the very start, and that is this idea that you might actually, through a theory of this kind, get some kind of insight as to what the structural features are of how the mind represents information it gets through language, and structural features that go beyond the way in which one normally identifies content. Hans Kamp, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. If you have any questions about this episode, you can post them to our blog at lucian, that's L-U-C-I-A-N, dot uchicago, dot edu, slash blogs, slash elucidations. On the blog, you can get background information on the topics we covered and join in the discussion.